may be seated. Good morning. Good morning and Merry Christmas. All right, here's a question for you today. How many of you are already finished decorating your homes inside and out? Well, looky there. How many of you have not started yet? Okay, all right. How many of you are in between? Okay, all right, very good. I, we caught everybody then in one, one form or fashion. Merry Christmas, guys. Good to have you with us on this first Sunday of December. Uh, it is rapid, ra- rapidly approaching, but uh, uh, last night was the first big night in the new neighborhood that I now live in, all right? Um, we had little samples of it since last Friday, all right? Cars started driving through, looking at all the lights, but uh, last night it did take me five minutes to get uh, about 200 yards, all right, to get into my driveway. But five minutes wasn't bad, all right? In the big scheme of things, it was pretty cool. Um, we have an uh, inflatable nativity uh, in one section of our uh, yard art for Christmas. And uh, I love going out every now and then and standing on a porch and just watching people go by. They're walking as well as driving by and uh, saying Merry Christmas and visiting with folks. And uh, I'm standing out there last night and there's this family going by and there's an older sister holding the hand of a smaller sister. And the smaller sister looks up at the nativity and says, a baby. And the bigger sister goes, shh, that's baby Jesus. <laughs> I said, well, at least that older sister knew who baby Jesus was. That's good. All right, that is terrific. But anyway, what a, what a wonderful festive time of year. I just absolutely love it. Welcome to New Hope Church today. If you are a guest, it's your first time to be with us. Uh, you have honored us by choosing to worship with us today. We're so pleased that you are here. Uh, There are some communication cards in the pew. I'd love for you to take one, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag. We make some promises here. We will not beat on your door. We will not bother you on the phone. But through the mail, we're going to send you information that tells you about New Hope Church, answer your questions about our staff, our ministries, what we believe in. And uh, we would love to get that information to you. So uh, thank you for doing that. Those cards are also for the rest of our church family to get messages to our staff, prayer requests, praise items, uh, questions. We'd love to address those. So please take the opportunity to use those cards as you see fit. Uh, Let me highlight a few things that are coming up. Uh, Please take note, we do have our 6 o'clock evening services, all right, on Sunday night. They're continuing on through the month of December. Uh, Tonight will be at 6 o'clock. They will be looking at phase two of Advent Conspiracy. Uh, They've looked at spend less. Uh, Tonight's going to be on the subject of give more, all right? Um, They will eventually look at love all and worship fully, all right, during four of the five weeks of December. So, love to have you come at 6 o'clock tonight. Our high school worship team has been leading in worship during this series. They did a great job last Sunday. Uh, The future of music is in good hands if they are an indication of what we have in store for us. So, uh, would love to have you come and join us at 6 o'clock. It goes from 6 to about 10 after 7. And a great way to meet other people you might not meet otherwise here at the church. Next Sunday night, a little bit different. A little extra program. Um, six o'clock service next week will be in the sanctuary. That is December the 10th. Our children in Sunday school have been practicing for over two months now a Christmas musical play. And they will be sharing that with us next Sunday night at six o'clock uh, here in the sanctuary. So hope you will come and join, support what our kids have been doing and working on for the past two months. They are going to do a great, great job. Uh, Prime Timers Luncheon is on December the 12th, so please take note of that. Um, On December the 17th, that is our Christmas musical and message morning. Please note the times. They're slightly different on December the 17th, 8, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. All right, 8, 9.30, and 11 for our three morning services on December the 17th. Christmas Eve services will be pretty traditional, all right, in the morning, all three times. Uh, Tim Kepler will be with us on Christmas Eve. He gets back from Japan, so he'll be with us on Christmas Eve morning. And I think I persuaded him to do 8 o'clock service as well. So we'll probably have 8 o'clock service in here uh, on that Sunday as well. We have two Christmas Eve services in the uh, afternoon and evening. There'll be a 4 o'clock one, which will be finishing up the Advent Conspiracy series. And then we'll have our traditional 9 p.m. Christmas Eve service, come as you are. Are, all right, so you can come to both or pick one. All right, but we'd love to see you then. Uh, I think those are the updates I need to bring to you. Apart from our church-wide meeting uh, is at 12:15. 
Uh, in just a few minutes, I'm going to give you a quick capsule of what we're going to talk about. Uh, and it's going to do one of two things. It's going to either encourage you to come back at 1215 or to shrug your shoulders and say, oh, well, that sounds good. We trust you and not show up. And we can live with either one of those. But we would love to see you at 1215. Um, if you do have an angel tree uh, gift that you uh, took an angel and you are purchasing gifts for that angel, uh, those need to be here by next Sunday. That is the cutoff date, all right? Uh, the boxes uh, that we are doing with Samaritan's Purse, Operation uh, Christmas Child, um, those were due today. Um, if you are coming back tonight to the 6 o'clock service, you could bring it back this evening. I think there are a few empty boxes out in the foyer if you wanted to still go do something today. We have exceeded 120 boxes for children overseas, so great job. Along with our 260 or 70 angel tree, we're going to be taking care of close to 400 children who would have gotten nothing this Christmas. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, all right, let me, uh, uh, if you are a guest today, what I'm about to do is not part of our normal Sunday morning worship service. But um, since we are a church and we are a 501c3, uh, the state requires a few things. One, you have to have a budget. And that budget has to be approved by the organization. And so every year about this time, uh, we have to prepare and propose to our church body uh, our annual budget for 2018. And we will be doing that at 1215 today. Um, here's what I can tell you about the budget. Uh, the budget is going to be is asking for 7% more than what we asked for for 2017. Now, we have exceeded uh, income over the year has exceeded what our budget was for 2017. That's always a good thing. We love that. We've kind of been on that roll for about 10 or 11 years now. Um, usually we've tried to keep our budget increases to less than 5%, but I made a promise to our staff and to the church last year that uh, my biggest target for this coming year was going to be increasing the salaries of our staff here. That is not increasing my salary, all right, but in increasing the others. I told the board a couple of years ago, uh, till the day I retire, I'm good, but we need to take care of our, our other staff members. And so um, most of that is reflected in this year's budget. We have not cut ministries uh, at all, but uh, we also asked them this year to be very cautious as they gave to us uh, their proposals, and we tried to accomplish everything that they asked for. Um, so that's the budget that will be proposed for you uh, this afternoon, all right? Um, I can tell you we're going to come very close this year to taking in and tithes and offering what we are asking for for next year. The last few years, we've usually always exceeded it. This year, we're going to be really, really close to that. It depends on how generous people feel in the month of December. Um, the good news for a pastor is we have five Sundays in December, all right? <laughs> Pastors always love five Sunday months, and we particularly like this year. This is a really peculiar year. There are 53 Sundays this year. So we didn't have just four months with five Sundays. We have five months with five Sundays. So I think with that fifth Sunday, we are going to get very, very close with all that. But anyway, that, that's the general things that we'll be talking at at 1215. And uh, we'd love to have you back to inquire about that. We, uh, we are not going to have any elder recommendations. We thought we might, but there are a couple of uh, folks interested in that who have not yet decided. They're going through the process. So that will be, will be delayed for just a little bit. Uh, the, the other very important discussion that we're going to talk about, not really have any important decisions, but we will have a frank discussion. As many of you know, we had intended to expand this sanctuary, and we had approved all of that. By the time we got through plans and it got through the county and the county got through with all of their newer requirements, what we were going to do was add 27 feet to the sanctuary, which would give us another 100 more seats in the sanctuary uh, and remodel our bathrooms and our stage. And by the time the county finished with those plans, it was going to cost us twice what the original proposal was, and we were going to lose 12 seats of seating rather than gain 100. And so as you know, we chose to just do some remodel work without changing the footprint of the building. So the stage has been uh, expanded, the new rock wall in the back, the new wood floors, uh, the bathrooms have been remodeled, some wiring has been done, some new lighting has been put in. So w we did as much as we could to get the best use out of this building we can and decided we would save the additional resources for the other project that you all had determined a few years ago would be the next phase after we did what we could to the sanctuary. And that was expand to a multi 
multi-use. We don't even know what to call the building. Most of us on the staff call it the barn. Uh, <laughs> um, but it is a, um, a multi-ministry faceted kind of building. It's where we could have um, meals together as a church or big functions together because we can't do that without going off-site now. We could handle uh, funeral receptions much better and community events. Uh, and so uh, that's where we've directed our attention. Plans are being finished now. Um, so without plans, we can't get hard costs of what it would be to actually build this. But we have designed something. The architecture has done us a rendering. I'm going to show that to you in just a few seconds, and that's what we're going to be talking about also in the 1215 service. So um, remember, this is going to house our offices and a multi-use facility that would probably seat about 400 to 450 in a round table dining situation, all right? Where now we can handle 90 to 100, all right? Um, we could also use this big room on Sunday. Some are saying, Tim, but if we have a bigger sanctuary, more people could come. Well, we can have a different venue, all right? And it's being done elsewhere, and it's being done very, very well. While this service is going on, it can be piped into that building over there. They can have their own worship leader, their own uh, kind of like MC of the service. And then when it's message time, they push a button. And as you are hearing the message in here, they will hear the very same message over there. And so we can have a different type of venue for that. And that building would allow us the opportunity for some expansion in that way, as well as take care of many of our social kind of needs that we have as a church. I said in the 8 o'clock service, ladies, and then I had one man say, ah, some of us men would appreciate it as well. It's going to have a really nice kitchen in it, <laughs> which is a frustration for folks at special events around here right now. Plus, it will also house our offices. If you've been here very long, our offices are in a triple-wide trailer, all right? They've been there for 14 years, and it really has been just fine. It was very cost-efficient. However, on occasions, I feel like I hear a truck backing up, getting ready to haul us away. <laughs> and, and so uh, eliminating that possibility would give great security to some of the staff. Uh, but anyway, are you guys ready to see the picture of, of kind of what we're talking about? Um, not that it couldn't be altered some. Uh, it very well may be, but here it is. Okay, so you like the looks? All right, yeah, I think it looks really good. It fits in with what we've got. Um, this building will go, it'll run the same way the sanctuary does. It will start about 40 or 50 feet from the shed that is in the back corner of the property, and it will extend on out towards the street. Uh, it will be, uh, uh, it's, it's 60 feet wide and 150 feet long. Okay, so it's bigger than any of the existing buildings. The front portion of that is the offices. The back two-story, it looks like two-story, but it's not, uh, is, is the multi-use facility. Um, the rest of the property would be in parking, all right? So everything else would be in parking. We would be finished here. There's nothing else that we could do unless we tear something down and rebuild something, all right? Because all the usable space would be, would be taken up. Um, we had hoped that this project would come in at about $1.5 million. Um, not sure that's going to happen. Uh, when we started talking about this, prices were down. The longer we've talked about it, prices have gone up. Um, we can't give a definitive price until we get the finished plans, and then um, Steve Drake's construction will be getting bids on those plans for us and letting us know what it's going to cost. Now, when I present to you a cost in January, we should have that, that's going to be if everybody else does the work. That's going to be what it will cost us if there's no volunteer labor. We can reduce all of that by some things that we can do ourselves. And we'll try to give all those plans to you as well. We're guessing this is going to come in somewhere at about $2 million. Okay? Uh, we've, never had a <coughs> we've never had a project that big uh, here at New Hope. We've, we've raised one hundred and fifty dollars and 200000 and you all have been very generous to do that. This is a little bit bigger than that. I don't like debt, so this would be a three-year, paid-back, finished, done deal, um, or we can't proceed with it. We also have to remember to do that. We can't stop our regular giving. This is sacrificial. This is above and beyond. Otherwise, the ministry that you're trying to expand falters. And so we have to keep all those things in mind as we choose to do this. So we will be talking about this at a little more in depth in that meeting at 1215. And then there'll be a meeting sometime in January just on that subject where together we'll make a decision whether we're going to proceed with this uh, or not. Okay. Um, I did give a chance at eight o'clock. This is not the business meeting, but quick comment or question. I'm going to give 60 seconds for a quick comment or question or two. 
Um, it's probably going to be wood because they say we can do it cheaper with wood than steel. And cost is important. Good question. Our guesstimate is uh, it will probably take us a year to get all the uh, uh, architect plans, bids, hard costs all finished, and fundraising a year. If we could break ground a year from this January, I'd be really happy. Um, and then it would probably take a year. So that's, that's, that, that, that's a ballpark at the moment. What I've discovered is things never go as quickly as I want them to. Okay. All right, so those are just a few of the updates that, uh, that we wanted to share with you. So uh, at this time, we're going to uh, ask our ushers to come forward and uh, enter into uh, our worship. Uh, gentlemen, would you come? We'll pray, and then the worship team will come and lead us. Father, I love you. I am uh, grateful for who you are. We talk about things like um, buildings and facilities, and it's easy for us sometimes to, uh, to get caught up with those things and forget that what ministry is is really about people to people. And the buildings and the facilities are to be the best resources, use of resources that you provide for us so that we can express your life through us to a community who needs to know more about Jesus. And Father, never, never let us lose sight of what the purpose is. This is, this is not to make a statement of, of any earthly value. This is to be a statement about kingdom value, about eternal worth and truth. And Father, we know the resources are yours, but you provide those resources through us. And uh, I pray that we will be very wise in our dependence upon you as we make these decisions. We want your will and nothing less, nothing else, nothing more. Father, we trust you with needs today for the Klomp family. We just had the memorial service for Carl last Friday. Uh, thank you for the difference that he made in the lives of so many as we heard them give tribute to him. Father, for George Wise, the um, shirt tail relative of mine from Shafter who passed away last Sunday during our last worship service, uh, we pray for his family and his friends as they gather tomorrow to honor him. And we trust that your son, the Lord Jesus, will be lifted up high and holy in that service. Father, you know what our needs are today, those who've gathered here and uh, the reason that they've come. And I trust through the message of both music and word that our hearts will be encouraged and cheered and we will be of better use for you in the way in which you want to express yourself through us. We trust you with all the other needs. There are hearts that are hurting for a variety of reasons today. There are some that are confused about what next steps in their life are going to be. There are others who are just simply coasting through life. Um, and I trust this will be a pivotal moment, a turnaround moment for us as we contemplate how you make a difference in us. Thank you. In the incredible name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. There was, a, there was an older woman... She had found it uh, growingly difficult to drive her car out on busy streets, and shopping and crowded stores became more and more difficult, and um, shopping for her kids' and grandkids' Christmas presents just became a real challenge. So this particular Christmas, she decided that she would put a check in a card and send to each one of them with a little note. A couple of days after she had mailed all the cards, she discovered that she had forgotten to include the checks in the cards. Can you imagine all of her kids and grandkids opening up the card and reading Grandma's note that said, buy your own presents this year. <laughs> I, in the 8 o'clock service, and I heard it from over here on my left in this service as well, somebody said, that's a great idea. <laughs> Um, along with her challenge of getting out and uh, uh, shopping, there was also probably a little bit of lack of, of preparation as she sent those things out, double-checking, that, making sure everything was done properly. Most of us have discovered in various activities of our own life that it, it pays sometimes to take a little bit more time in our preparations. And I would suggest to you that that's particularly true at Christmas. In fact... If you haven't figured it out already, let me announce this to you today. 
it's time to prepare for Christmas. Uh, it's time to get that uh, tree. It's time to... Yeah, yeah, I, I dawned on me this week as, as I was driving down our street looking at all the decorations of the neighbors. It dawned on me, when I was a kid, we didn't decorate till December the 14th. Now, around our family, that, that was the reason I remember that day is, is that is my birthday. And we always bought the Christmas tree on my birthday. That was part of my birthday present because I loved picking out the Christmas tree. My mother and I let my father and my sister pick it out one year, and it was the sorriest looking Christmas tree <laughs> you have ever seen in your life. And my sister will verify that story, all right? <laughs> and my father will verify that story. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a sad Christmas tree. It reminded me of Charlie Brown. Um, but anyway, if you haven't done it already, it's time to dig out those decorations and get busy inside and outside the house. Uh, for you bakers, it's time to get all those uh, great recipes out and to begin to put them into practice, make those cookies, bake that fudge. And for those of you who know I don't like chocolate, I do love divinity. <laughs> Haven't had it much since Grandma McLean died. Uh, understand the weather's got to be just right in order to make good divinity. Uh, it's time for you to help your kids write those letters to Santa Claus. It's time to start the Christmas shopping. Uh, and I know, how many of you do Christmas shopping through Amazon now? Yeah, I hate all of you. Yeah, there's just something. <laughs> Shelly does it too. I have a figure. I, I, I guess I'm not techie enough to figure out how to do it. I just don't trust they'll send me the right stuff. All right? That's my biggest problem. Um, it's time to make plans if you're going to be going out of town at all during the holidays. Uh, time to practice, rehearse the music do the plays, prepare the lessons, get fresh sermons ready. It's simply time to prepare for Christmas. We really can't postpone it anymore. If you haven't figured it out, it's just 22 days left before Christmas shows up this year. Not time to panic yet, but it is time to prepare. But I wonder, I wonder with all the preparations going on, will we take time to do the most important preparations? I suggest to you the most important preparations are not our house or our recipes or our trees or even our Christmas musicals and plays. And I'll even toss in our sermons. I think the most important preparation that we can participate in is the preparation of our hearts for this Christmas. It's an internal preparation. So often Christmas becomes a bother rather than a blessing. Often there's more headaches than there are hallelujahs. All because we fail to pay attention to ancient words written by a prophet thousands of years ago. You'll find these words in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. If you want to find it, let's turn there. This would be a good verse for you to underline. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Is anybody getting too cool? Okay, if you turn the cooler off... It was warm, it was really hot, but let's try it off right now. That's the, yeah, the inside one. Uh, nope, not that one, Eddie, the inside one. There we go. Just turn them to off. Okay, here's what the prophet, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ and thousands of years from our present moment, he wrote these words. There's a voice of one calling, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Those words were prophetic words about John the Baptist. Those were the words that were repeated again by an angel to the mother of John the Baptist, a cousin of Jesus Christ, born a bit before, within nine months of Jesus for Mary and her aunt were pregnant at the same time. And the angel told John the Baptist's mother, you're going to have a son. And her birth was just about, her pregnancy was just about as miraculous as Mary's pregnancy. All right? And um, the angel said, we're going to give you a son late in your life. And he has a very, very specific purpose. His task is to make straight the way of the Lord. To prepare the hearts of those to hear what Jesus has to say. 
John the Baptist was technically the first worldwide evangelist. <laughs> He's the first one who ever preached a message of repentance and be baptized for the remission of your sins, for the king is coming. And that was John's assigned task from the very beginning of his life. I suggest to you that the role that God had given to John the Baptist also needs to be fulfilled in our lives as we prepare for Christmas. We need to prepare our hearts for the Christmas story, which is the way of the Lord. And our lives should be part of that highway that God uses to communicate himself to the rest of the world. This morning, I want to suggest to you or offer to you three ways that we can prepare our hearts for this Christmas. We're going to begin by looking at the first thought out of the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's the third book in the New Testament. It's the third in sequential order of the four Gospels. It starts with Matthew, continues to Mark, Luke, and then John. Um, Luke's one of the more interesting writers, I think, at least from my perspective, of the four Gospels. Uh, Luke was not a Jew. Luke was a Gentile. Luke was not a, a fisherman or a tax collector like Matthew and John. Luke was a doctor. He was well-educated. He was well-liked because he was a doctor. And he wrote the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, for the express purpose of connecting the message of a Jewish Messiah, a Savior of the world, to the rest of the world. But he didn't come just to seek and to save Jewish people, but Jesus Christ came to seek and to save all who want to know him. And Luke wanted to do that. And so Luke tells an interesting story in chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. Luke was present to hear an awful lot of Jesus' own ministry. He was an eyewitness to much of what went on. And so he records for us in Luke 18 this story. He says, people were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. I suggest to you that those verses offer to us one way in which we can prepare our hearts for this Christmas. And one thing that you and I can do to prepare is to become a child again. Let's continue to look at the story of Christmas with childlike eyes and a child-sensitive heart. After some last Christmas shopping with her grandchildren, this one particular grandma was rushing them into the car when four-year-old Jason said, Grandma, Susie has something in her pocket. He reached in and he pulled out a big, giant red hair beret. Do they still wear, do girls still wear berets in their hair? Oh, barrettes. I didn't have small girls, all right? Barrettes. A beret, oh, all right. They don't just, no, never mind. Do you still have barrettes? Okay, all right. Well, so she had this big one. She took Susie back to the store, made her put the item back where she found it. As they were going through the checkout, the clerk asked, have you kids been good so Santa will come to you? And the little boy said, I've been good, but my sister just robbed the store. <laughs> Christmas is for children. I often hear people say it and, I wonder what they mean by that. Sometimes I wonder if they mean they've gotten too old and too grouchy to enjoy celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. I sometimes detect a little sadness, a little disappointment, maybe a little longing for the days when they enjoyed Christmas as a child. Yet in this passage in Luke's gospel, Jesus seems to think that even grown-ups need to maintain childlikeness. He once told a man named Nicodemus, that the only way to see God's kingdom was to be born again. Nicodemus had a tough time getting his head around that concept and even asked Jesus what may have been, you know, you've heard the statement, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Nick might have asked a stupid question that day. 
And Nick said, Jesus, I'm a grown man. How can I climb back up into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, Nick, Nick, come on. I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. Jesus said something similar when his disciples think that Jesus is too busy and he's too important to take time for children. Jesus tells his disciples, guys, don't you realize how important these kids are? Children are our model for how to enter and how to live in the context of God's kingdom. Unless we become a child again, there is no way we will ever get to heaven. And and what does Jesus mean by this? First of all, let me tell you what he doesn't mean. He does not mean that there's anything wrong with growing up. And it's probably time for a few of you to do that. (laughs) Nothing wrong with growing up. There's a big difference between childlike and childish. Big difference. Most of us know that children are not always little angels. Bo might be, but as they carted him out of the 8 o'clock service today because he tried to out-talk his grandfather, (laughs) which I found quite enjoyable, actually. And Jesus is not discouraging us from maturing with age. In fact, that sometimes is a problem. Some adults have never matured. They haven't outgrown temper tantrums or selfishness or unforgiveness. But despite all the negative things that we lay aside as we grow up, there are some things that we need to hold on to, no matter how old we get. Let me give you just two examples today of what I think Jesus meant when he said we must become like little children and how this applies to us preparing our hearts for the celebration in this season we call Christmas. The first childlike characteristic that we need to grow in as we mature as believers, is our dependence on the Father. Our dependence on our Heavenly Father. See, children need somebody to take care of them. That's why God gave them parents. They they do some things for themselves, but they depend on adults to do many things they can't. And, And you know, most kids really don't mind this arrangement. If they have good parents, most kids don't mind that they don't have to worry about food or clothes or transportation. For some reason, they keep that up into their 20s. They they trust their parents to take care of them. Uh, Children are a model of what our trust should look like in our Heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11 says, Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who have evil in you, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who trust in him? Jesus tells us that we should become like children and depend on our heavenly Father. Jesus as man, and let me say this a little differently, Jesus as God intended man to be. Do you understand that? Jesus born sinless, the only one on the face of the earth ever in the history of the world ever born sinless. There was just one other man created sinless, and that didn't last long. Adam was created as God intended man to be. Jesus was birthed as God intended man to be. Adam ceased being the man that God intended man to be when he chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He stepped out of dependence upon God and stepped out into independence from God. And that's what sin is. Independence from God. Jesus, in his own life, for his full life, until he paid the price on a cross for our independence from God, in order to be the appropriate sacrifice that would pay back our independence from God, he had to be fully dependent on God. Did you stay with me on that? And that's what he did for all of his life, from beginning to end. And here's how we know that. For in John chapter 14, verse 10, Jesus says it this way. Don't you believe that I am in the Father? and The Father is in me. 
The words I say to you are not just my own words. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And as my Father sent me with all that he is living in and through me, now so send I you with all that I, the Lord Jesus, am. I will be in and through you everything my Father was to me. That is the Christian life. Becoming a child is learning to depend fully on Jesus Christ. So one way we become like little children is through dependence. I did not say depends. Okay? <laughs> Nothing wrong with depends. They're very helpful. All right? But this is dependence. The, the second way we become like little children is wonder. That's W-O-N-D-E-R. Children see the world so differently than we do. Kids are amazed at simple things. A caterpillar spinning a cocoon, a falling star, a waterfall cascading down the mountain. I, we went to the, the Clovis Christmas Parade last night. Uh, went with Bo. Things I'd stopped doing for 20 years, I'm doing all over again. I'm, I'm living my second childhood all over again. But it was down there with Bo, and I went for a walk before the parade got started. And, oh, he points, light, moon. That kid loves the moon, man. He just loves the moon. And, and then every, every float that came by, every group of singers that came by, every truck, every four-wheel drive that was decorated that came by, wow, ooh, wow. I mean, I got to be honest, 10 minutes I was bored stiff. Okay, okay, I've seen it, been there, done that, all right. Uh, and, and, and then I started watching Bo. Wow. Ooh. And he looked down and said, Grandpa. Ooh. A child's wonder. The simple things still marvel him. They love hearing the stories of David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den and Jesus walking on the water and they have no problem believing them and they would say, read it again, Daddy, read it again. But we get too old for that. We don't take time to see and to wonder at what's so amazing. We're often like Moses, nearly walking past the burning bush and not stopping. We hurry on and miss the living God who's waiting to dazzle us with his glory. And, and that's why often Christmas just becomes another day. We don't really take time to look at the baby in the manger. We go, oh, baby. And hopefully there's somebody around that says, shh, that's baby Jesus. Wonder. We've stopped wondering and we've started wandering. Jesus calls us to become childlike again, to look at the world around us, to look deep into his word that he gave us and let him dazzle us with who he is. Let me challenge you. Prepare your hearts this Christmas by becoming like a child again. Don't regress to childish ways. But what if you practice depending on God more instead of worrying and fretting more? What if you took time to stop and look at the wonder of God's world and the wonders out of God's word and the wonders of not just what God did back then, but what is he doing right now, even in your own life? Becoming a child again is a great way to prepare our hearts to celebrate this birthday of Jesus Christ. The, the second thing I think we could do to become childlike again instead of childish is found in a little passage in the book of Acts. If you go from Luke, Acts is just two books, two neighbors to the right, all right? The book of Acts chapter 20, verse 35. If you have a Bible that has red print in it, this will be the only red sentence on that page, Okay? Bibles that do it in red, these are the words that Jesus actually said himself. And that's why you have red letter Bibles. All right? Just makes it, it doesn't mean that it's more important than other verses. It just lets you know Jesus said this himself. And here's what it says. I'm going to back up to verse 35. This is, um, this is Paul talking here. He has he has been in Ephesus for a period of time. He has started a church in the city of Ephesus. And it's become a strong church. And 
Paul's about to move on as a missionary to another community and do it all over again. And he's kind of giving them their final message. And um, he wants to remind them of something very, very important. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we can help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. What's fascinating about me, and I did not know this until this week about this verse. This is the only place in the Bible this verse is found. Now what's interesting about that is it's in the book of Acts. It's not in the Gospels. See, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are basically the biography of Jesus Christ. It tells us his story from four different perspectives, four different people who knew him, who walked with him. And God moved upon them to write their story, so we have this picture of Jesus. That verse is not a repeat of anything that was said in the Gospels. I don't know exactly when Jesus said this to Paul. I don't know if Jesus said something like this on the road to Damascus and it wasn't recorded for us in that part of the story. I don't know if this is something that Jesus taught Paul when after Paul became a Christian and God sent him out into the wilderness for a little private Bible college tutoring that God did with Paul before he started his ministry. If this is something Jesus said to him then. Or if this is a quote that Paul got from Luke or Matthew or Mark that they had actually heard Jesus say and simply did not record it in their Gospels. But I want you to notice how precise Paul is. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Paul said, this is not my words. These are the words of Christ himself. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Do you remember Mrs. Alcott and the little women? Remember what she said in that story? Christmas won't be Christmas without presents. Do you remember that? That is a nice tune. Um, this idea of presents at Christmas is what some Grinches gripe about. Everybody thinks Christmas is all about giving and receiving presents. That's not what wrong with Christmas. In fact, I kind of like Mrs. Alcott's thought. Christmas really isn't Christmas without giving and receiving. But here's the key. If we want to prepare our hearts for Christmas, we've got to rediscover the blessing of giving. I think Paul didn't want the folks at Ephesus to forget the blessing of giving. In Luke 6.38, it says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it will be put into your life. The idea is the same. Giving brings more blessing than getting does. The trouble is, in 21st century culture, we're not too sure about that. Our culture emphasis, puts a lot of emphasis more on getting than giving. I mean, kids make a list of what they want to get for Christmas, not what they're going to give for Christmas. We walk into Walmart, we spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars on presents for ourselves and for our family, and we toss a few quarters into the Salvation Army bucket. We don't mind buying presents for people, but there's an expectation. They better buy one for me. Think about what we've called gift giving recently. There you go. Gift exchanges. That just assumes I'm going to give and I'm going to get. Think about how many times we've unwrapped a gift, we got excited, and two months later when somebody asks you, what did you get for Christmas? You had to think really hard about what did I get. Children wait all that time to open up the toy they could not live without, and then they end up playing with a box that came in more than they do the toy that they got. Or the dog chews it up and it heads in the dumpster two months later. Let me, let me tell you a joy that will never fade away, though, when you give a toy to a child who has no parents. Angel tree. When you bring food to somebody or give money to feed somebody who would otherwise go hungry. Rescue mission. When you share what you have with the person everybody else forgets to remember. When you give of your time to visit somebody who is lonely. When you send a card or a package to a soldier overseas who's spending another night to keep us safe here at home, those are blessings and gifts you will not forget. 
John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God is in the gift-giving business, and he wants us to become like him through dependence and through wonder and give as well. Understand the value of giving more than getting. The, the third idea that I think will help prepare our hearts for Christmas. Remember what the first one was? What was the first one? Say that again. Become a child again. That's all right. And we become a child. Don't be sorry. At least you took notes. Be, become like a child. And we do that through dependence and wonder. Then we need to, second of all, rediscover the blessing of giving. And let me highlight the last thing. It's found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Now I'm wishing I hadn't had you turn the cooler off, but it's okay. We'll make it. We're nearly finished. Paul wrote these words. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. I think that includes Christmas too. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God. There's that word children again. Without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. The third way we prepare our hearts is, folks, let's turn the light on. Let's turn the light on. I have always liked lights. I've always wanted lights on the Christmas tree. I wanted lights on the house. I love it. I love them when they're different colors. I love them when they're all the same and they twinkle. I like lights. I, the thing I don't have this year, that'll be next year that will go on the house. I want a big star at the pinnacle of the house. All right. I want an angel blowing a trumpet with bright lights on it. I love lights. I could just sit sometimes. You'll find me in the living room where our tree is. I will just... Sit and stare. I just love it. I enjoy it. You know, the neighborhood we moved in, it's Candy Cane Lane area, and, and, and I'm having a ball. I'm having fun. I go down and visit with other neighbors who are out, sit by a fire, chat, sit on my porch, wave at people, tell them Merry Christmas. Um, I would sing, but then they would never come back by my house again. Um, here, here's the deal. Uh, last night, uh, as I, after I went to the, the parade, I had to come back, and it was about 7. Now, everything gets going about 5.45. It's when the crowds start. At least that's last night. It took me five minutes to get about 200 yards to get to my house last night, which wasn't bad. But here's what I found out is you've got to have the lights on by about 5.15 because that's when it's just now starting to get dark. And I was told cutoff time is 10 o'clock. So that means I have to be home to turn the lights on. And I know some of you are going to say, because I've already been told this by numerous folks, you got timers. you got timers. Okay? I, I, I get that. And you're going to say I'm weird, which you've said before. <laughs> now I'm giving you evidence. Um, for me, this, this is not an aspersion at anybody else. This is for me. For me, part of the gift is having to turn the lights on. For me, that's part of the gift. It's, it's the effort for me because I have to willfully make time to get there, to do it. It's part of the offering of the gift. I have to stay up till 10, which is not really hard. But if I want to go to bed early, I can't because I, cause, well, I'm also cheap because I don't want to pay for that PG&E bill <laughs> to go all night long because I didn't stay up to turn them off. But for me, that's, that's part of the gift. Turn the lights on. See, it's a willful choice. And, and, and you, you, there's no automatic timer that we can put in our heart that says, okay, Lord Jesus, turn the lights on in my life. Jesus has given us the freedom of our own if we're going to turn the light of his life on in our life. The Lord Jesus referred to himself as the light of the world, but he also called his followers to become the light of the world. And Paul echoes that same idea in Philippians that we will shine like stars 
in the sky. He wants us to live differently. When everybody else is griping and fussing, we need to practice contentment, thankfulness, and love. When everybody else is sorrowing, we ought to be comforted, comforted, contented, and trusting. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and not brag on you, but glorify your Father in heaven. Perhaps at no other time of the year besides Christmas do we as believers have a chance to shine in the darkness more clearly and more beautifully. There are people where you go to school. There are people where you work. There are neighborhoods in which you live in that can see the message of Jesus in you if you'll simply turn the light on. Christmas is our time to shine. And by shine, I don't mean show off. It's not a time of self-righteousness, but on the other hand, it's a time to explain to people about the baby in Bethlehem, how he changed your life. We're doing a little class on Wednesday night of how to share our faith at Christmas time. It's, it, trust me, it's not rocket science. But we're just looking and talking amongst ourselves of ways that we can implement the message of Christ into our regular routine of life, sharing our faith in Him. This week we're going to talk about how do we write our own story in three or four minutes so that we don't have to take forever to tell somebody how the Christmas story impacted our personal story. Our theme verse for that that study, our theme verse actually for a study men are doing on Thursday morning as we look at the subject of apologetics finds itself in 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. This is where it starts. You can't skip this step. In your heart, this is turning the light on. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Poop, flip the switch. Then be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason of the hope that you have. If you have turned the light on and Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be living a hope-filled life that will prompt somebody to say, how, how, how do you get through that like that? If you haven't turned the switch on and Jesus isn't Lord, nobody's going to be asking the question. They're looking for something different. Let me challenge you this Christmas to shine bright and beautiful as the light of the Lord to others. Some of you are saying, Tim, that's ah, just not my calling. I haven't had any training. Can I, can I remind you today of one story out of the Bible? You remember the story of the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well? Jesus met her. It was a one-on-one -on -one encounter. The disciples were heading into a little community to see if they could buy food for lunch. Jesus said, I'm going to hang out by the water trough, the well, and uh, when you guys find something, come back and see me. Uh, Jesus knew there was a divine appointment that needed to be kept. And a woman from town comes out to the well. She came at midday, not the normal time to get water. Women normally went together as a group. That was their culture. They went together as a group to get water. Not a whole lot different than our culture. Women go together to the bathroom, all right? Uh, they, they, they went together to go to the well, all right? And, and she went by herself because she was ashamed. She had been ridiculed. She had been talked badly about. She had been looked down upon. She had been married multiple times. She was currently living with a man. Not a lot different than the 21st century culture. And she goes out there alone. And she meets Jesus. And Jesus talks to her about a water that will satisfy her thirst, where she will never need water again. She was a little bit like Nicodemus, and she scratched her head, and she said, man, I'd love to have, you know. And he said, I'm not talking about your physical thirst. I'm talking about your spiritual thirst. Jesus said, it's why you've been married so many times, and you're living with somebody now. You're looking for something to fill the void in your heart, and I have it for you. And we don't know all that was said between those, but here's how we know that it ended. She drank from the water that Jesus offered. She accepted Jesus as her Savior. And the Scripture tells us she ran back to town, told all the people in town about the one who told her every lousy thing she had ever done in her life and still liked her, and she brought them out to hear Jesus for themselves. And the way that story ends is like this in the latter part of the chapter, and many that day became followers of Jesus Christ. 
Now, how many evangelism explosion, how many Operation Timothy classes had that lady gone through before she went back? None. How long had she been a Christian before she went back and shared? About five minutes. And she went back and simply said, i got to tell you, he's made a difference in my life. Come hear him. We don't have to be well-trained theologians. We've got to turn the light on. Let me wrap this up. It's a true story. It was about two weeks before Christmas. A nine-year-old girl was walking with her friend down the street, slipping and sliding on the ice. The two of them were talking about what they hoped to get for Christmas. They stopped to talk to an older gentleman whose name was Harry. They, they had been by his house many times. It was kind of junky looking. Um, Harry was rarely out and didn't seem to be very friendly. When they went by this day, Harry was down on his hands and knees around a big oak tree and he was pulling weeds. And they asked him what he was doing. They saw him in a frayed woolen jacket. He had a pair of garden gloves that the fingers were worn out and his fingers were almost turning blue because of how cold it was. As Harry responded to the girl's questions, he told them he was getting the yard in shape as his Christmas present to his mom who had passed away a few years before. His eyes brimmed with tears as he patted that old oak tree and he said, my mother was all I had. She loved her yard and she loved this tree and so every Christmas I do this for mom. His words touched those little girls and soon they were down on their hands and knees helping him weed out the garden and clean up around the tree. It took all three of them almost the rest of the day to complete the task. When they finished, Harry reached into his pockets and he pulled out everything he had. It was two quarters and he gave one quarter to each of the girls and he said, I, I wish there was more, but that's all I got. The girls had often passed that way before and as they walked home, they remembered how bleak this house looked. It was never decorated for Christmas. No tree, no decorations, no cheeriness. Just the lonely figure of Harry they could see through a curtainless window as he stared at the oak tree. That quarter seemed to burn a hole in one girl's pocket, or her conscience anyway, as she returned home. And the next day, she called her friend, and she said, Hey, why don't we put both our quarters in a jar? We'll call this Harry's Christmas present jar. And we'll get some odd jobs, and everything we earn, we'll put in the jar and see if we can make Harry's Christmas better. Two days before Christmas, they had enough money in their jar to go buy a new pair of gloves and a Christmas card. Christmas Eve found these two girls on Harry's front porch singing Christmas carols. When he finally opened the door, they presented Harry with their gift and their card. Oh, Harry pulled off the pretty paper the girls had wrapped the, the gloves in, and he read the card, and he held in his hand a pumpkin pie that was still warm from the oven. With trembling hands, he set the pie down, and he took those gloves, and he buried his face in those gloves, and he wept. He said, since my mother died, no one has given me a thing. What well, generosity came from those two young girls. Lessons we can learn. This year we can survive and thrive this Christmas season rather than gripe and complain about the bother or yawn when the Christmas story is read and just be glad when the whole thing is over. Or we can prepare our hearts for Christmas the way these girls did. By being childlike by discovering or rediscovering the blessing of giving and then by choosing to shine like stars in a dark world. I wonder, how is Jesus going to call you to prepare your hearts this Christmas? Let's pray. Our Father, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you give us great wisdom from the challenge of Isaiah to prepare a way for the coming of Jesus to the challenge of being childlike, of depending, of wondering about your marvelous acts, to learning the joy of giving and to find a way to shine in a dark world the light who was birthed in the world 2,000 years ago. Father, I pray that um, we'll discover those truths for ourselves and appropriate them and we'll walk in dependence upon you so that we can be childlike. We can be shining stars. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Uh, 12.15, we'll be right back in here.